Hey, it's Mazzy, and uh, this is a really fun video for me, and I'm excited to talk to um, Zev Feldman, the jazz detective, and we'll tell you what the jazz detective is. We'll let him tell us. And a uh, couple of releases uh, for Record Store Day we're going to jump into, and I had a preview of these two, these Ahmad Jamal uh, records from uh, recorded in Seattle, where I am right now, in the early 63 to 66. Uh, two records coming out, and I think there's a third one. We'll talk about that uh, in the future. But uh, Zev, pleasure to meet you. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me and talking about the records, jazz records, uh, resonance, resonance records. Uh, this is probably my first uh, resonance records that I got. Um, so I'm a big fan of most of these. But I want to talk about the archival thing and what you do and how you do it and your love for, it seems like, primarily jazz. So. So thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me today. Oh, anytime. So, so t I don't know where you want to start, but the now the newest project you're working on is mm -hmm. your own imprint. It sounds like the yep. Jazz Detective. Yeah. Is that a, a self-proclaimed name that you came up with? I felt like I should nab it because people have been calling me this for a number of years now. I also like the Indiana Jones of jazz. Robert Baird from Stereophile was very generous. Mm -hmm. But I have just been so fortunate, Mazzy, over the last 10 years or longer. You know, I've been fortunate. I've worked in the music business for close to three decades now. But um, about 12, 13 years ago, George Clavin, the owner and founder of Resonance Records, uh, made me a deal. He said, Zeb, if you can go out and find a previously unissued recordings have never been out before i'll entertain and that record you're holding right there bill evans some other time was really like an album that really broke down a lot of walls and and got our name out there and I, i'm extremely proud of that release i mean it's a it was a previously unissued studio album from 1968 that i found out about when i was in bremen germany at the Jazz Ahead conference many years ago. And I found the family of MPS Records. I mean, I'm so fortunate. I love shopping for records and hunting. I'm a record hunter. And um, sometimes I'm fortunate enough to meet people who um, are family members of musicians, or in this case, I met the family members, a family member from uh, MPS Records. And Is this the first residence you put out? that you put it, out that you this found? was we actually did uh, a first one called alive at top of the gate which was my boss george clavin's recordings that he had made at the village gate jazz club at the upstairs room top of the gate back in 68 and in that came out in 2011 and we released uh bill evans live at top of the gate and a west montgomery album called Echoes of Indiana Avenue within a few months of each other. And then back on Indiana Avenue, which came a few years later. And I love this record. I love this period. I mean, I love this period of Wes Montgomery. Uh, a little different than his later slicker stuff on CTI, but I just love this stuff. You know, it's remarkable because with Wes Montgomery, we were very lucky to be able to unearth this chapter that had really been underdocumented for a long time. And um, it all started back around 2010. Michael Cascuna had contacted George and I about some recordings that he was in possession of of Wes Montgomery. We didn't know anything really about the recordings themselves. We knew they were from Indiana. We we knew um, that it was Wes, but we didn't know who else was on there. So George sent me to Indianapolis three times. I met with the family. I met at the time with some musicians and folks at New West. And unfortunately, some of them are no longer around. Dr. David Baker, the legendary photographer and musician Duncan Sheet, uh, Chuck Workman, a DJ and, and local music historian. And we pieced together that album. You know, at Resonance, a lot of folks know us because of Wes Montgomery and Bill Evans. They are in the fabric, the bedrock of our company. And you're holding and right And that call. I Matt love this. Cole, this was a Grammy nominated box set that we did. I think we actually have some copies left, by the way, in our warehouse. <laughs> but that was it. It has been a journey of meaningful curations, of doing projects that we're passionate about, me especially, 
I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store every day. Doesn't mean you get to eat all the candy. Some of it's not meant to come out, but you know what? It has, George Klaben opened the door for me to pursue my dreams of being a record producer. I was a sales and marketing guy for the first 15, 16 years of my career. And then he said, I'll tell you what, if you can find stuff that's never been out and I like it, you can produce it. And we've started this. So that's where the jazz life. detective uh, moniker really comes in. You're a it, sleuth. You're a jazz sleuth. Well, if you say so, I feel it. I, I'm just so lucky. I feel grateful to do something in my day to day that I love. I love working on these projects more than anything. It's not work to me. I tell people it's time management. It gives me a reason to leap out of bed in the morning. Looking at an email, have we heard back from this archives? Did we get this music to listen to yet? Did we get this permission from this artist or family or record label? And there's a lot of steps that go into it. And it has been a trade, a skill that George Clayton has allowed me to learn, which now I'm very fortunate. I work for other labels such as Elemental Music. I work with Blue Note. Bill Evans, you know, again, uh, th that's Morning Glory, one of two yeah. projects of Argentinian recordings that we had that we put out. Now, what's special about that, this release right here, Morning Glory, is that this recording uh, from 73 and another one from 79, which we put out at the same time, that had been bootlegged. And I like to tell people we have an ability of turning water into wine, if you will. Even if a recording was out there for years, if the music's great. In the case of that Bill Evans, that Morning Glory release, we were able to find the original tape reels and work with them from the original source. And I mean, this is almost like the... I mean it's great because it, you put out these archive. you don't do reissues you do archival things for the most part that haven't been released i mean this is almost like a, a barbershop window before and after here but um <laughs> but i call them archival stuff. discoveries they're not reissues they are they are new releases that are out for the very first time and you know bill evans is someone that's so special um, wait till April and November of next year. Folks, there's more Bill Evans coming of unissued recordings. It's unbelievable what we're finding and finding great music. You know, there's a distinction, Mazzy, between good and great. And we have to really be that filtration sometimes of releasing the very best of the best. And we've been fortunate. It's amazing to me that we are continuing to unearth all these discoveries all these decades later. And in some of the cases of these musicians, it has gotten even more important. Um, you know, these legacies mature, even, you know, I don't know if that's really the word, but these artists become even more important as the years go by. And it's made me happy to work on them. And I, I'm happy to share these with the world. You know, what, what interests me is, um, I've been a jazz fan since I was maybe like 1920 is what I got into. And I'm somewhat older than you. So it was around like 19. I remember 1970 was my first jazz album, Bitches Brew. I bought it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I returned it. Three years later, I got uh, someone who's playing in the store and it hit me right away. But otherwise, it was a CTI album by Stanley Turrentine and Milt Jackson called, uh, where he opens up a speedball called Cherry. And it was, you know, it's just a really great album. But I've been a big fan of the bebop era. My two favorite artists, uh, my favorite jazz artist of all time is uh, Charlie Parker and then Dizzy Gillespie, probably. And, you know, talking about, you're talk, we're going to get into the uh, Ama Jamal in a minute. They were so, he was so influenced from that bebop stuff originally, and it really changed. And I find that a lot of these uh, new jazz buyers who have been in rock and roll or maybe come from the audiophile side, just like maybe the blue note or these really slick things, which sound really amazing. But then if they listen to a Charlie Parker and they don't realize it's not going to sound in the same recording wise, but you got to go to the music. And that's what's so great about some of these archival. I think most of them sound really good. There's some that maybe are from a tape that is from a concert that may not be as pure and pristine, but it's about that friggin' music first, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it boils down to that first 
and foremost and how important is the recording how great is the music is it happening you know um it happens not everything is an audio file pristine perfectly engineered recording but we're lucky that we even have these 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 artifacts that exist i don't even like that seems like it trivializes it yeah. but you know what i'm saying it's like we're lucky that some of these recordings exist and oh my gosh charlie parker i mean there is a great example right there that we're lucky that so much of this documentation exists and um, have you passed on anything that you just thought oh this is really cool but the sound is maybe not right for the audience i mean is, is that you did take that into consideration well, we always take everything into consideration as much as possible. I think that there's also, I want to say, abilities that we have these days that make vast improvements, at least to make things a little easier. But, um, you know, there there have been. There definitely have been recordings. Oh, man, am I proud of, of that project right there, Palo Alto. Yeah. Well, I, I, I only interrupt you just because th this is part of the story. And and. What's what's brilliant about this? I I met Danny Schur years ago, um, just because of the Bill Graham. I mean, he wouldn't remember me, but you know that whole story. Of Danny Schur working in Palo Alto High School and securing calling out of the blue Thelonious Monk to play in your high school gymnasium. What a great story! And I love this performance. Is it the greatest sounding? No, but it's really good sounding. Even even the uh, what's funny the custodian uh, mix, I guess, but. Just the, the care you all collectively, I guess, put into this with the poster and the book and the brochure, just amazing stuff, you know, at the high school. Look at that. Great stuff. That was an but that was unusual. Program. That wasn't through your imprint, right? That was through Impulse. No, that was through Impulse. I, I, I'm lucky because of George Clavin. He has a, been so generous to allow me to work not just with Resonance, but I work with Blue Note. I work with Elemental. Um, and I've worked on a few couple of projects with impulse with the nicest guy ken drucker over at verb label group um and um you know it's about finding a recording you know there's a protocol in the way that we work sometimes mazzy because if you find a tape um you know we really start with was the artist under an exclusive term at the time the recording was made if so you have to go to that company to get their blessing and you know, John Coltrane, A Love Supreme, live in Seattle, is a, a really good example of that. This is a project that Speak of the devil. You, you got them all there, man. Wow, I'm a big, I'm a big. I'm, obviously, now that I'm in Seattle, I go with that because I've re been researching the penthouse and with some of these record. You know, before my time, uh, I've said before we came on uh, the recording, I drove by there uh, like a couple months ago when I actually when I got this 701 First Avenue at Cherry. It's a friggin' parking lot. They paved paradise, tore down the hotel this jazz club was in. And it's a shame. I mean, I, I get historically, maybe people don't give a crap, but it's like tearing down the, I mean, if they ever tear down the Fillmore Auditorium over my dead body, but they do this kind of stuff. The Avalon Ballroom, you know, mm -hmm. the Blackhawk is torn down in San Francisco and is still an empty parking lot. So uh, there's, yeah. There's this was the, uh, an amazing release, that, that, that is, and you know, this is a very special project. Um, I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Stephen Griggs, who was working with the widow of uh, Virginia Brazil, her late husband, Joe Brazil, was friends of John Coltrane and was there and made that recording. And um, some friends of mine introduced us uh, to Steve Griggs. Steve had these tapes and... Um, you know, sometimes it's, well, it's really important sometimes. There's there's a lot of people out there, a lot of record companies, some, not a lot, some that operate under a different code of ethics. And um, we wanted to make sure that those tapes stayed out of the wrong hands. George Klaben at Resonance and I brought those tapes in and we took them to Universal Music Group, to Ken Drucker at Verve, which paved the way for a release. And um they were also very nice to allow us to be co-producers on this project with Mr. Drucker. And that's how that came about. I knew the Monk family from working on Les Liaison, Don Jerus for Sam oh, Records. And you Saga did that Pass. tenants? You did the tenants? Well, we, we did a we did a box set on vinyl, which also had some alternate takes and some rehearsals and stuff. And we did a CD release. But oh. I've been fortunate because I've known the Monk family for about 10 years now. And um, they brought me in to work with them on that project and with Ken Drucker, of course, who 
greenlit that and made it possible. And, um, you know, I work for a lot of different folks and that's like one of the exciting things. My my dear friend, Corey Weeds at Real to Real and Seller Live in Vancouver. He's also been fighting a good fight with me. And, you know, what happens, Mazzy, is I find a recording. I have to be really passionate about it and excited. And then it becomes about where can I release this? Where does this go? And, you know, not everything is a fit for each record label. So I'm lucky right. because I know many of these different companies. So, you know, Corey and I have been very fortunate to work with the Left Bank Jazz Archives. We're going to be releasing a bunch of things next April together. Sonny Stitt and Shirley Scott and uh, and Walter Bishop Jr. that have never been out. Is that impulse that's, stuff? Is no, sunny no, stuff? that's going to be real to real. That'll be with uh, Seller Live, and it'll also be for Jazz Detective, the Sunny Stitt. I can't There's, keep up with your, your, your imprints or your projects. I know. I, 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 for me, it's just about finding the right home and the right fit for right. putting these projects out officially. Nice. So um, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about, okay, Record Store Day is coming up on mm -hmm. uh, Black Friday, and you do a lot on Record Store Day. But you don't only release things to Record Store Day, do you? Or, or are most of your releases Record Store Day? Well, you want to know something? Record Store Day is a really important event. And they I harness Record Store Day to make these projects work. They are very difficult. This is the new Ahmad Jamal Emerald yeah. City. It's, you're holding up 1963 and 1964. I love, I mean, all, all your projects have these separate books and you know since and i know the work it takes obviously from the the uh, essays you have collected from different artists even getting ahmad jamal uh, uh to you know allow what is he 92 now to yeah. allow this to come out a recording uh from these series of recordings which we'll get into in a minute i know about photo research and photo licensing and things because i i do that on the other side of it a little bit and i've been involved with it so i know you know it's funny what I read these comments, whether it's video on, on my videos or on, you know, forums and everything about how come this or that costs this much or that much. I know what goes into the design, the licensing, the curation, the mastering. People don't realize all the the, the individual costs that go into making uh, these kind of projects. You know, tens of thousands of dollars. Literally, when it adds up, I've told people this before. It's like you're building a pizza pie with different toppings, photographs, your engineer, your remastering, all these different elements, the writers, the designers, the everything that goes into it. And it's enough to hemorrhage a company. It is enough to, um, you got to like enough for you to mortgage your house against. It's a massive investment of resources. And I, I, I love, you know, for me, it's about quality. It's about, you know, I want to raise the bar. I really try to elevate the art of record making. And I say this because I've been for decades myself a record collector. And for me, I know certain touch buttons, things that matter to me. And if somebody's going to go out and put their hard earned money down to buy one of these projects, I want them to have an incredible experience. Great music, first and foremost. But you know what? I think it's investigative journalism. I think there's a story to tell. There are musicians that knew these musicians or there was somebody that was around at the time. And I want to tell that story. I want to bring it to life with photographs. I want to create a Rolls Royce experience for well, someone. Well, the Penthouse was a jazz club. I think it opened around the same time as the World's Fair uh, in Seattle, 1962. I never went to it, obviously, before my time. And uh, is it Frank Puzo? Is that his name? Charlie Puzo. Charlie Puzo, senior, who was, right. Who was, uh, who just loved jazz and had this great kind of wonderful place in the bottom of a hotel on First Avenue, Pioneer Square. Now, what's what's great about these, I've been playing these uh, since these arrived a few days ago, and these are, these sound really good. And they're from, uh, the. I, I understand the Penthouse had a, a deal with uh, the local FM station, so they're the recordings you'd hear off over a, uh, a radio broadcast. Now, did they record them at the side of the penthouse or through the station? Do you know? Well, they were recorded at the penthouse through a line that went to the radio station where they were recorded. These are broadcast quality recordings. Yeah, they're really good. 
there, there happened to be in mono. Jim Wilkie was the producer of the program and the engineer. And this was a program that ran on Thursday nights, half hour of jazz, it was called. And people would be out driving their car. They hear the music, come on down to the penthouse. And people would come down to the club. Totally different era, by the way. But, you know, um, it, it was really interesting the way Mr. Puzo booked the club. Artists would play Thursday through they would do 10 day run so they could do two radio broadcasts two thursdays and two weekends that they would do and it has been a joy working with charlie puzzo jr uh the son of charlie puzzo senior the club founder and owner and jim wilkie who produced these broadcasts you know um i'm fortunate because i work with a lot of different tape archives the penthouse jazz archives is extraordinary what was documented i mean miles and coltrane came played that club ahmad jamal played well he there's about six hours of these radio broadcasts that were done and by the way mr jamal was filled worked with me on everything about this project these emerald city nights releases are a dream mazzy because um I I have I've lived with this music for many years now. Uh, Charlie Puzo Jr. gave me a Tupperware, two Tupperware tubs full of CD transfers that were made of all the broadcasts. And I've been living with this music. That is Charlie Puzo Sr. and Ahmad Jamal. And, and he wrote Ahmad, the, or this is from an interview you did with him. There's a, a cut right here. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it, we spoke with Ahmad. Ahmad was involved. Mr. Jamal was involved with every aspect of this recording, from listening to the music to commenting on the sound during the engineering process to approving the voices of people that we spoke with for the package. He did interviews for each volume. And we also spoke with some really wonderful musicians, too, whether it was Emmett Cohen, Aaron Deal, Monty Alexander. Um, a whole host of individuals that had stuff to say about Mr. Jamal, but this is like holy grail. This was, if you wanted to get into the Ahmad Jamal time machine, this would be an amazing place to go back to. And it's because of these documents that existed, we we're able to do that. And it all started a year and a half ago, Massey, because I've lived with this music and Mr. Jamal's associate, Andrew Stamen, who is one of his like managers, his day-to-day -day guys, um, contacted me out of the blue for another business matter. And when we were talking, I said, you know, it's nice to meet you. And by the way, I know of six hours of radio broadcasts. Could I send them to you? Would you share them with Mr. Jamal? Now, Mr. Jamal has a reputation, like a lot of musicians, of being very kind of skeptical of the past, you know, always looking forward. But I'll never forget getting the phone call from Mr. St Andrew Stamen saying Zevi really loves what he's listening to. I mean, he he was he he was excited about them, and it opened the pathway for us to examine doing this release, and and then it became about finding a record label that could provide a good home, and at that same time, I was starting to hey think to myself it'd be great to have a little vanity label to do projects of you know, releases that I want to do. And I've been living with this music. I kept putting it on all these years. And then he heard it. So we started talking with the folks at Elemental Music uh, last year about the concept of doing, I wanted to do a label group and I call it Deep Digs. I want it to be archival music across numerous genres. And one of the label imprints that we have underneath it, I mean, jazz is a part of my life. People know me. I mean, am I not going to put out some jazz recordings? So we came <laughs> up with Jazz Detective. And that's our label imprint for jazz recordings. And anyways, these are the first two volumes. There's going to be a third coming out next year. But these are recordings made in concert. I mean, with bassist Richard Evans and Jamil Nasser, drummer Chuck Lampkin, uh, Frank Gant, even Vernell Fournier. This is amazing music. Um, but I'll leave it to the fans. I mean... What is there to say? I mean, Mr. Jamal is somebody who you cannot put in a category in music. He was pushing boundaries in terms of time and space. There is a reason why Miles Davis loved this man's music. And well, he's, a, he's an interesting connection because in a way he, he comes out of being influenced by, like we talked about before, the bebop era, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie. 
And um, I, I think he did his first, uh, is it Argo? The, the big hit he had, which is a lot of people don't know Argo was a division of chess records, the, yeah. the rock and roll, record, Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And he was selling, like selling more than most jazz artists at the time. So he wasn't a, a poor, strung out jazz artist that you know wasn't selling records. He was selling records. Um, was it the Alive at the Pershing? Uh, Poinciana. It was like one of the big hits that back in the hit, day. Right. There was a jukebox business too. And we talked to Marshall Chess of Chess Records in in the notes. There is a statement from I read him. that. Talking that. about that. I mean, I wanted to tell the story inside and out. And, you know, Poinciana is one of the most um, biggest hits of all time, if you will. It was an enormous, successful release. And it, it turned a lot of people on. And, you know, there was something special happening in Chicago. Argo, hey, Ramsey Lewis on Cadet, which was another imprint who we right. sadly just lost recently, uh, who we also interviewed for these releases as well. Um, it's just so meaningful where we have a chance to put together, but so much history, but Ahmad Jamal it, matters. Yeah. yeah he's, but he straddled and like, he, he had a little, some pop, not pop sensibilities, but he crossed over into the cool jazz thing. And, and some of the, like, I hate to say that there's a, there's a segment of snooty jazz people that for a while that didn't, I don't know if they just didn't say take him seriously, but he's almost too melodic. Like people go to Oscar Peterson. He might be a little too melodic for some people, but he, the sound on his piano playing is actually very, uh, I mean, people go back and forth with um, Bill Evans. Uh, Bill Evans is probably my favorite piano player, but he's so different than like, uh, I mean, some of the artists like I did in the 70s see McCoy Tyner and McCoy Tyner to me, we used to joke, not joke around when I was a rock and roll 20 year old 22 year old seeing him live at the keystone corner was like he was like the led zeppelin of piano playing because he was so intense on the keys and you don't hear him like that at all it's he just goes in the he, he's very floating is that is that a w nice way of putting it well there's all these different things that are happening within the music that i appreciate and it's it's all his own the way that he you're going to listen read about Hiromi talking about space and how that influenced her he did things very different he is so unique in his artistry and you know what by the time i mean this is a man who was a child prodigy and whose own there is an evolution of this artist but he is really one of the most important figures in this music and um, I'm I'm just really proud that he would even want to work with me and to be so involved. I mean, he did he worked on everything with us on these projects, and it's been what's nice about these thrilled. these are trio recordings. So it's bass, uh, piano, and drums. There's no horns on them. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them probably did he ever. He wasn't a someone who played with horns, right? Well, in guitar, and I'd have to I'd have to go back and research that a little yeah. more. Okay. But yeah, he. But I was playing this and my friend who's been on my channel a few times, the archivist was here in my house and she heard like I was blasting and she heard a plan. She goes, what's that? Because she's a big fan of Bill Evans. And I mean, of more of the accessible. And when I say accessible, some people think, oh, that means it's too clean and too easy. It's not that at all. But it, it but it's very enjoyable. I mean, there's some drum solos on the first one, especially in bits, but not elongated drum solos that if you're not a drum person that you know drive you crazy it's very accessible but very smart and um, it, again these are really well recorded so these now the one that's coming out i think each one is a two year so 63 64 mm -hmm. 65 66 and i assume 67 68 is next time at 66 to 67 will be later next year um yeah it's just it it, it's great. So what colored tint are you picking up for the cover of that one? Are they uh, going to match? I, I, <laughs> I, 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 they do. They're all different. You know, I want to tell you something. I am not a fan of doing volumes one, volumes two, volume three. So they're separated by the years. Yeah. And I thought that, that they're all, you know, important. And I didn't want people to throw oh, it's the third volume or the second volume. They all matter. And these were cut by Bernie Grumman, right? They were. He cut the, okay. Oh, sounds good. Um, so are there any, you mentioned a few little hints, but aside from these, 
uh, what other kind of plans that you feel you comfortable in mentioning uh, in the future for either the jazz detective or I assume things through other labels are maybe more private, but sure. we'll pull out what we can, Zev. Well, um, first of all, I'm very excited. This Friday, uh, we will be releasing on Blue Note Records, a project that I stayed the course with probably longer than any other production. And that's Elvin Jones Live at Pookie's Pub, which were recordings made in the summer of 1967 by this 20-year-old a recording engineer named Bob Falish, um, who was someone that I was introduced to about 11 years ago. And um, we are releasing these on Blue Nut. These are amazing quartet recordings featuring the great Joe Farrell, uh, Wilbur Little on bass, uh, and Billy Green on piano, who some mm -hmm. folks will know from that legendary album record called Heavy Sounds that he made with Richard Davis. But these are very important recordings. I, I, I'm excited about them. They move me personally. And um, I carried them on my back for a long time. And it's a great uh, deal of excitement for me to see the vision realized. And that'll be coming out. That's uh, Elvin Jones' Revival, live at Pookie's Pub. And I had the good fortune of working with Ashley Kahn and also David Weiss on that as well. I mean, some of the other projects we have for next year, um, man, I will just tell you now because there haven't been formal announcements made, but we have unissued studio recordings of Chet Baker. We have Sonny Stitt, Walter Bishop Jr., Shirley Scott from the Left Bank uh, that I had the good fortune of working with Corey Weeds on, which is going to be coming out. We have previously unissued Bill Evans, on Elemental that'll be coming. Man, you haven't heard it all yet. We are literally through so much research that we are due, finding more and more recordings. Um, I've also got some other stuff too. I'm working with the estate of Sister Rosetta Tharp. I have oh. recordings that have never been issued before from the 60s that we will be issuing. On I would love paper. to hear that. I can't, that's I. Uh, good one. I, is that going to be a? Is that going to be in your imprint? You know, or is that that'll that'll be for deep digs, and okay. uh, that's going to be a chance for me to do some things just outside of jazz, which matter to me. You know, listen, people know me as this jazz detective dude, but um, I'm a lifelong record collector. I I collect classical recordings too. I'm a big. I live in the world of classic rock and the Bay Area psychedelic rock and. You know, I mean, we, we, there's well, that's a lot my, of different yeah, stuff. That's my, yeah. I, and I, it resonates with me, Mazzy, what you're doing because you're really spreading the gospel and, and, and just, you know, getting a chance to celebrate the legacies of all these. A ma an old man talking about back in my day, the Jefferson airplane were playing free in the park, you know, that's it. And the Grateful Dead. But that, now, let me, let me just off the cuff here because I've done a series called It's the Music Stupid. I did it with uh, Joe Harley and, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but give me a couple of records that you really love that, that you haven't worked on um, in maybe uh, their jazz, maybe their rock, maybe there's something else. Well, uh, well, let's talk about if you had to ask me what record have I listened to more than any anything in my life, it would probably be the Beatles White Album. Um, that was a recording I started to listen to as a very young child. My father was tired of flipping the records over on each side, so he recorded it onto his Sony reel-to-reel -reel tape player, and I would sit back on the couch with these Koss headphones that were as big as my head, and I was this kid with ADHD, but for somehow, man, I was able to just focus and tune out the rest of the world and listen from start to finish. And I've listened to that body of work probably more than anything. And it also taught me a great deal about listening. Um, but, you know, I mean, what what else have I not worked on? Oh, my God, Jimi Hendrix at the Fillmore. The box set is extraordinary. I mean, I'm an enormous Hendrix fan. I I, I, I love the Stones and who, I mean, I mean, this okay, is you're, my taste. Okay. they're all over the place. I'm not just a jazz guy. I hate to break it to people, but, but I'm an archival guy. Like to me, there is a future in the past. There is, you know, you got to know where you've been to know where you're going, but it's just about what moves me. 
you know, right. I, I think about, you know, I go to the gym and I listen to Misfits and The Clash and, and, and other stuff as well that might surprise some people. But to me, it's just, if music is something that moves you, it's subjective. Um, and I think that like a lot of the people that are watching, we're lucky because we have an opera, something clicks with us. We, we feel things, maybe we're sensitive people, but we hear music and it affects us a certain way. That's how it is with me. And that's how I feel like so fortunate that I found something like a lot of us in this lifetime that speaks to us. Music is king, art is king, expressing yourself, poetry, words, creativity. But, well, um, that that's really great. You can love. I mean, if you're in the music business, you should love the music business. I had a ten year stint in the music business when I was young, and I loved it. And I wouldn't trade that in the world. It was the right time. I was I saw the right shows, whether it's jazz shows. Uh, you know, I saw Bill Evans twice, one or three times. Keystone uh, and what happens in San Francisco. All those artists would probably come down from the penthouse and do the West Coast thing. They do the Keystone earlier, the Blackhawk. But there's also, I don't know if you've heard, there's a, you know, that club, a uh, Bach Dynamite Dance. Uh, it's, sure. a, yeah, I used to go there on Sunday afternoons. It was down near Half Moon Bay. So whoever played the Keystone, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday that week, would do a Sunday afternoon thing. And early on, it was like free. You walked in this beach house, grab a beer out of the refrigerator, put some money in the basket or whatever, and was very loose right on in Montera near Half Moon Bay. And it was a great place to see these. And the other time, I think I, I saw one of the uh, Tony Bennett uh, shows with uh, Bill Evans when they did that album. Um, but also, it was just because right place, right time, and all that. And hearing you talk about this passion of this music, whether it's rock or jazz or whatever it is, it's just really great. Because, But a lot of times you get in the record business, and it's all about the business so much, it's hard to enjoy it, I found. Uh, when I got out, I had a little bit of a, you know, it took me a while because I wasn't getting all the free records and everything, but I enjoyed the music. I could listen to something more than two or three times. I think one of the things that I feel very lucky about is that these days, hey, man, I've had times in my career where I have promoted and worked on projects that weren't necessarily the most exciting to me. I worked in distribution for the first 14 years of, of my career um 12 years 14 yeah, 12 anyways you know so I, but, but now these days i get to choose the projects that i'm working on i am passionate about it i am the one that has to have conviction in my soul to sell people folks that i want to work with why do we need to do this Zep? this really matters i mean i have to be excited about it and and that is something that I'm I thank my lucky stars for. And you know, we'll have A and R meetings at some of the labels I work with. So Zev, one label in particular, so Zev, but tell us which one are you most excited about? Uh, and to me, that's everything. And these are my babies, these these records so, that come out. But I So I this was the easy pitch, but you did it yourself, but you got a, a distribution. Now these are uh right now, these are five thousand pressed of each yes. for record store day and yes. is this uh international is this only uh domestic at this point do you know it, it's international so i believe it's three thousand in the united states and two thousand okay because i get a lot of people from europe watching from you know germany and the uk and and beyond even they're yeah, available so. globally through a wide network of distributors thanks to my good friends at elemental music so we're with with the folks at integral formerly known as Pias in the UK, uh, France, um, in the Net Benelux. We're with King International in Japan and the United States. We're with Universal Music Group, with the good folks at In Grooves, who have been my distributors at Resonance and also Elemental. And I'm just, I'm, I'm lucky. People, you know, good things are happening. But you know what? It's really happening because of so many of the fans that are out there watching right now. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be doing this. I it's mean, you. Oh it's my God. You. <laughs> and it's, no, but, but there's so much truth to that because, and, and let's talk about something too. Okay. I want to talk about record store day. They started this man. They really gave birth in so many ways to allowing these projects to happen. You were asking me earlier. So do you put out everything on record store day? Well, 
for a lot of the major archival releases I do. And why is that? Well, because if we're fortunate and lucky enough to be accepted for our submission for Record Store Day, it allows it allows the project to work. It allows us to, we have to do financial analysis on every project that we do. We don't just decide, hey, we're gonna do and we, we make yeah. it. We have to plan everything. But Record Store Day, because we know that we're gonna ship sold out and by the way we make the right number i'm not this isn't about the long tail this is about get on in on this special event you, you know and and um but because of record store day so many of these projects have been made possible i cannot thank the entire organization enough for being so supportive michael kurtz carrie cotillion all of these the whole organization now i feel so lucky um, so I just want to keep going. I want us to all keep going. I'm already like planning through the end of next year and beyond. And it's well, you about have to a, with the way the pressing plans too, and and the printing and all that stuff. Right now, that you, right there, you sounded like we're at the Grammys, and the music's going to cut you off because you're. I would like to thank my mother and my father, and I. I only could do this if it wasn't for you, the fan. Well, that's the truth. That's the truth. They started all this. Thank you for all their support, people out there. If you're there, no, I really appreciate it. We're just having fun, and we're and we're on this journey together. Everyone gets to be a part of the event. The people that go to your local record stores and buy these releases, even if they're not a record store day event, because I work with a couple of clients that don't record labels that don't do that. But for the most part, that's when we release them. And um, anyways, I'm just so grateful. I just well, want to well, live another day well, keep doing this. Will Will you go into uh, one of the stores on Record Store Day? Do you do that very much? I do sometimes. I do, right. and I and I like to go out there and see what's happening. But can I tell you, every day is Record Store Day for me okay. and oh. for you too. But but no, but yeah, I but totally. I do, and I do like to go out and 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 meet the people that are are doing these. But um. Anyways, oh my gosh, you got more okay, there. We're, we're going to wind this down, but th th I love this because we could go on. We, I could talk about music, and I like the business of music, too, and the marketing. And, and again, I said early on this many times, I get I get kind of pissy when someone says, oh, it, uh, not with your uh, gear, but with whether it's a Paul McCartney limited box or whatever, cash grab, cash grab, cash grab. I think of all the people who who are employed designers and photo editors and copy editors and printers and mastering engineers and and on and salespeople that are are making a living because of these records these are two more that i have i didn't bring up just because um you know i have i don't have everything you've done but i have a lot of them these were record store day this sonny rollins is great uh this is cool this is really out there shit but it's great out there shit um it's, uh dolphy eric dolphy of course um but I love, this is why I do this thing on YouTube, because I love music. I like talking to people about music. We could go on forever, but um, any last words where I think we're going to close down now? No, I just want to thank everyone. I want to thank you, and thanks for the love, and let's keep going. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Zev Feldman, thank you, the jazz detective. Now, do you need, when you're doing jazz detecting in each city, do you have to register at the local police department to make sure you're a detective like in L.A. or in New York or Switzerland? Not yet. No. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to stop this now. And uh, thank you again. Mazzy loves you. And thank you.